have a song before the sermon today? Or is that on Yom Kippur? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Why? I don't know. I thought there was an opening act, you know? I am absolutely admiring this newly renovated sanctuary because it is something extraordinarily special. We all knew that 27 years meant the sanctuary needed some work. What you might not know, unless you come from the days when Beth Torah was located at 163rd Street, is that the chairs that were in this sanctuary before the renovation here on Isbury Road were the same ones that were in the 163rd Street Sanctuary from the 1960s. And here's something that only a handful of people here actually still know or remember. Those chairs, even in the 1960s, were not new. They were purchased from a movie theater that went broke someplace up north. So they were used even then. But I have to admit something. As much as I love all the renovations that have taken place here, the architecture, the decorations, the technology, I was not actually happy to see the chairs replaced. I objected. These new chairs are aesthetically beautiful, obviously far more comfortable, and that's the problem. In the old seats, I knew that no one could fall asleep. You were worried when you sat down about the chair simply collapsing. And then every time you moved, there was a spring that jumped up and pitched you in the behind. It kept everybody awake. It was great. Now we've got seats that once you settle in, could put you out in 10 minutes or less. It reminds me of the story of the rabbis who were discussing their synagogues. They were at a convention. And you know what they do. They're boasting about how big their synagogue is. So one rabbi says, we have 1,200 Members. The other counters with, ah, but we have 400 kids in our religious school. And the other rabbi is looking for something, something in his synagogue that would be bigger. And he said, you should see our sanctuary. It can sleep 1,500 So I was sitting here in the sanctuary just a few weeks ago before services began and just admiring and enjoying the bima and the stained glass windows on the sides. And it struck me, this bima, these windows, this renovation contains lessons for the high holy days that are of great import. So I'm going to walk us through this renovated bima and share with you the lessons it taught me for these high holidays. So I begin by referring just to the idea of the renovation itself. It took place, as you well know, during COVID. And I will share with you, and Rabbi Roisman knows, many of our colleagues who heard about this very ambitious object project thought we were making a big mistake. They thought that during COVID, we should kind of regroup, retreat to the center, hold on as best as we could to what we had, since we all seemed in danger of imminent collapse. We didn't do that. We looked beyond COVID. We looked beyond the lockdowns. We looked with confidence in the future and how we could come out of it stronger, better, and more prepared for that future. We invested when others were retreating. We innovated, we adjusted, we Zoomed, 
The only Zoom I ever knew before that was Zoom Golly Golly. Then I learned what Zoom was. And we live streamed and we opened our schools safely. We accommodated those who were ready to return to the synagogue, to live programs, and we accommodated those who weren't ready. Through Zoom, we solidified our daily minion, which would have been lost. And the morning minion actually grew in participation. And we reestablished the evening minion, which we had lost to Ives Dairy Road and Biscayne Boulevard, which no one in their right mind was going to try and traverse late in the afternoon. Now we have it back. We came to a conclusion that seemed to be counterintuitive. We said, COVID, COVID has shut down or severely limited our services and our party in Decker Hall. So now is the time to renovate. Now is the opportunity. There's a beautiful Hebrew phrase, lirot et hanolad, to be able to see and imagine the future. Because here's the truth, a profound truth about synagogue life, community life, family life, life in general. If you are standing still, you're moving backward. There is no standing still in life. There's only moving forward or going backward. Any of you who have undergone surgeries on your knees or your hips or your shoulders or heart surgery, you know you must get up. You must move. You must exercise or things get worse. They don't stay the same. Standing still is going backward. They get worse if you don't stop moving forward. That is what Beth Torah's leadership, past and present, decided to do. Get up and go forward. Plan for that future when we wouldn't be hobbled severely by COVID. And you, the Beth Torah family, responded resoundingly like our ancestors did at Mount Sinai. Now, Asev and Ishma. We will surely do this, and we did. So let's walk this bima and learn its other lessons. Now, one of the most striking features, new features, are the two stained glass windows to the right and to the left of this bima. So take a look at that one on my left and your right. It has a beautiful saying by Rob Cook, who was the first Zionist rabbi who came over from Europe. This is pre-Israel days, pre-state days. Became eventually the chief rabbi. And he came over from Europe to establish a new Jewish community, hopefully a new Jewish state, which he was looking forward to in that period of time. And he said these words, Hayashan yitkadesh, v'hachadash yitkadesh. Now, we didn't put it in English because there's artistry to it and it kind of got too busy. But we have to understand these words. They're incredibly important. Hayashan, the old, yitkadesh, will be renewed. V'hachadash yit Kadesh, and that renewal shall be made holy. The old will be renewed, and that which is renewed shall be made holy. So as I said, Rav Cook was a profoundly observant Orthodox rabbi, pre-statehood. He came here, and he told his very religious very observant Jews, we will renew the old, what we brought from Europe. But the new that we create here must be holy. In other words, there must be respect for the past and must be brought into the present. But it has to be renewed. It can't be the same. It can't be identical. And the new that evolves, we must accept it, respect it, and make it kadosh, make it holy. So let me illustrate this specifically for our Beth Torah community. 
on the Friday night in the summer when we officially dedicated this newly renovated sanctuary, I stood right here at the Bema, actually right there at the Torah reading stand, and I looked out on the large crowd that had assembled. And this is what I saw. Right over there, right there, near the Kogs, a whole group there. What did I see? Families that have been here for over 50 years. There were some 60 years. And they had come here when they fled Castro's oppressive, repressive, murderous communist regime, regime, where Jews could not be Jews and expressing their political opinions could have meant imprisonment or death. They ran from that oppression and they came here to Miami with nothing. Amongst the synagogues that opened their doors and their schools wide open to them was our Beth Torah. Their children were taken into the schools. Their families were made members and they were made to feel welcome and embraced and not to feel like interlopers or a burden. That was the culture. That was the religious philosophy. That was the MO of our founding rabbi and teacher, Rabbi Max, along with the leadership and congregants who knew exactly what was needed and demanded of them, and they had to do it. And I saw those Jubans, those Cubano Jews, sitting in this newly renovated, renovated sanctuary last month, a completely different building on a different piece of property from where they arrived. And they were sitting with two and three and four generations of their descendants. And then I looked over there and I saw another group of families, more recent arrivals, coming slowly but surely for the last three decades, and then streaming in by the hundreds, fleeing a different oppression, this time in Argentina, where an economy had collapsed and anti-Semitism had raised its ugly head again, with bombings that killed hundreds. And the Beth Torah family, Chidesh et Hayashan, it renewed its founding principles and welcomed in this new immigrant group. It opened the doors of the Hochberg Day School and the Sheck Family Religious School and the Fisher Early Childhood and said, bring us your children. Bring us your families. We renewed the old and we made it holy. holy. And then we said, well, actually, I said, I am a Brooklyn, Los Angeles Dodger baseball fan. I am crazy about American football and the Miami Dolphins. I am immersed in the only culture I have ever known, American culture. Even the Judaism I was immersed in was thoroughly American Judaism. I live now literally five miles from where I grew up. My parents lived here in my community until their death, and they're buried here in Dade County. I've never even held a job outside of Dade County. Lori, my wife, was born on Miami Beach, grew up there, and her parents lived there until their death, and they are buried right near my parents. And what I told them was, I don't know how to be a rabbi to them. I don't know. So I turned to my teacher, Rabbi Max, and to the lay leadership. Many of you are here today or watching. And I told them, if we are really serious about this, serious about making Beth Torah for this new Latin community their home. I need a Latin rabbi. 
I need someone who understands soccer. I fall asleep on it. I need someone who speaks Spanish. They're Mama Russian. Who knows what they are going through because he went through it. And he has to be better than good. He has to be the best. So they know we're really serious. We're not just virtue signaling. And the leadership, in spite of being financially severely strapped at that time, said, without hesitation, Naseh v'nishma, we will do, we will do this. And so we brought the best of the best, Rabbi Roisman and his family, and we became what people would say, a very different synagogue. And I say, no, it's not a different synagogue at all. We were being true to our past. We renewed the old philosophy and made the new dynamic of our synagogue into something kadosh, into something holy. So we had adult education in Spanish, high holidays in Spanish. It grew to 700 people on Yom Kippur, and we put out a tent. And then we said, a tent isn't really a home. A tent is a sukkah. And a sukkah is for who? Wandering Jews. You put wandering Jews in a sukkah. Not wandering anymore. So we poured our resources into creating a home for that service right here under the same roof. Investing in soundproof walls and air conditioning systems that don't transfer sound from one room to the other. And this, I submit to you, was an act of holiness because it respected the old and made the new into something holy. Let me tell you really a profound truth. We don't do Spanish services because they don't understand English. They do. We do it. Because when they say yister, they need to say yister in the language that their parents and grandparents spoke to them. They need to hear the melody they sang in South America to their puppies and their babies, their abuela and abuela. See, I'm working on the Spanish. They never experienced a service without musical instruments because that was the standard in the conservative movement in Argentina. So we have a service with musical instruments and we have without, and they're both holy and they are both beautiful. They need to hear a sermon from a rabbi who lived their experience, who knows their history, what they long for, what they miss, and how their new home is a home but they can't forget their old home. And so Beth Torah has made the new into something holy. And we have renewed the philosophy that built this congregation. And on that Friday night, we welcomed a Ukrainian family which fled a war-torn country and we took their daughter into our early childhood program. And we stand ready for any other Ukrainians who come here in any Jewish community from South America, Latin America, or any part of the world that might one day need to be here. The old will be renewed and the new will be made holy. And I looked on that crowd that Friday night and I saw Jews who were born into this people. And I saw Jews who selected voluntarily to cast their lot with the Jewish people and the state of Israel. And I saw white people, and I saw black people, and I saw brown people, and I saw families with a father and a mother, and I saw families with two fathers and two mothers. I saw single parent families, and I saw Ashkenazim, and I saw Svardin, and I said to myself, this congregation, this sanctuary is filled with the Jewish people. Not one slice of our people. Not one or two groups within our people. Not one kind of family. 
but every kind of family and every part of our community. This is the Jewish community I imagined. The Jewish community of the 21st century, steeped in the centuries of Jewish history that preceded this. And it has come together to renew the old and make the holy new. And it is diverse and it is committed and it is talented and it represents Am Yisrael, the people of Israel, the entirety of our Jewish people. Now the same window over here to the right, your left. It's beautiful. Even without understanding the Hebrew words, it has such impact. But once again, it's important to understand the meaning. Meaning. It's at the top. If I am only for myself, then who will be for me? And if I am only for myself, then what am I? If I am not for myself, who will be for me? But if I am only for myself, then what am I? You've all heard those profound words. They're the guiding principle of our people, of our nation, of our people that come from the most studied rabbinic text that we have, the most known Talmudic text, Pirkei Avot, Ethics of Our Fathers. They're foundational to Jewish philosophy, Hakkadeh Nafi. Our task is to both live by and transmit Jewish values. Beth Torah, as Rabbi Royston said yesterday, is unabashedly and actively a pro-Zionist congregation. I never thought I would have to make that statement because every synagogue should be unabashedly a pro-Zionist congregation, but sadly, it just isn't true anymore. So therefore, we have to state it loudly and clearly and without any hesitation, without any apologies. In my over 40 years in the rabbinate, I have never not given a sermon on Israel on high holidays. Yes, I'm a cheerleader for Israel, but we don't ignore the internal problems that face Israel as a society or its struggles with the Palestinian issue. We don't pretend to always agree with the Israeli government's policies. We don't even agree with each other about the Israeli government's policies. For when it comes to Israel's right to live and thrive as a Jewish state, to protect its citizens, Jewish and Arab, from terrorist assault, be they attacks planned on the ground or missiles from the air, when it comes to fighting BDS, when it comes to speaking out and demanding action against universities, turning their eyes away from clearly anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic activities on their campuses, when it comes to supporting the work of our federation, which cares for Jewish families in need, supports Jewish education, important Jewish teen and college experiences, and ain't a neely neely. If we are not for ourselves, who will be? Who will fight those battles for us? We have allies, yes, particularly in America. To be sure, we have friends. But we have to lead the way. We have to be in the forefront of those battles. For who else will? But if we're focused only on ourselves, only in our Jewish community, disconnected, or ignore the general community out there, then what are we? For sure, we would not be the descendants of Abraham and Sarah, who famously opened their tents to all passerby. We went to rescue ho hostages, Abraham did, Hebrew and non-Hebrew hostages, without accepting any reward for the deed. Abraham and Sarah, of whom it is said, all the nations of the earth would be blessed by your presence. One of our most active committees is our social action group, which reaches out to the community on a regular basis to help the non-Jewish population and address some of their unique problems. If we are only for ourselves, then indeed, what are we? Now, you may have noticed something 
and that the final part of the saying isn't there. The final part of the saying, vim lo achshav, ain't my time. If not now, when? That's the call to action. It's not now when. It's not there in words because this entire institution, everything on this campus is an answer to if not now when. Our Jewish community is facing serious levels of assimilation exacerbated by a lack of Jewish education. So if not now when, the Shelley Early Childhood Educational Building, the Fisher ECA program, the Steiner Educational Complex, hundreds upon hundreds of children from the youngest ages right into their teen years. A commitment to Jewish education that has been from the beginnings of the history of this synagogue. The commitment to bring the best of the best educators, youth advisors, and teachers to do it now, if not now, when. We established with great sacrifice the Jewish day school now known as Hochberg Prep, thriving in its own facility, part of the Poznak system. Another example of renewing the old and making the new holy. When Beth Torah moved from its original home on 163rd Street to this new home here on Ives Dairy Road, there was a debate, a big question. Do we build the sanctuary first or do we build the school building? And the answer was a resounding, we build that school building first. Because our mission, the essence of our mission is to educate that next generation. The buildings are different, the staff is different, the methods are different, they are new, but they are a renewal of the old commitment to education. And by making education the centerpiece of the synagogue, we made the new holy. Our sanctuary needed the repair and renewal. It was COVID, but we said, if not now, when? We had never done a minion on Zoom, but it was COVID. And if we didn't, people would have no way to say Kaddish or hear a Torah reading or daven as a community. So we said, if not now, when? And we moved forward. And we couldn't get together even for the high holidays that first year. We had never even thought, never even imagined filming a service and then airing it on the high holidays. Nobody was prepared for that. But people had to hear a high holiday melody. They had to hear the shofar. They had to hear a sermon. But we said, if not now, when? And we move forward. And even today, there are those who can't be here. They're here with us, listening, singing feeling our presence in their homes. Standing still is not status quo. Standing still is going backwards. And that is something we do not have the luxury to do anymore. The time is now. It's always now. And we must move forward with confidence, with respect for the past, allowing the past to be renewed in our way and then to sanctify it to dignify and celebrate the new that we create in the image of the old. It's often asked, what is the most important verse in the Torah? So one rabbi says, the Shema, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Well, it's a powerful verse. The 19-year-old Israeli soldier who threw himself on a hand grenade in order to save the lives of the others in his unit. He shouted the Shema as he thrust himself towards the grenade. Another rabbi says, this is the most saint famous, Ki kamocha, love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else, said that rabbi, is just commentary. But then there was a teacher in the first century. His name was Ben Azai. And he said this rather strange thing. The most important teaching is Bring your korban, your sacrifice in the morning, and bring your sacrifice in the evening. Now, I got to tell you, I skipped over that one. I had no understanding of what he was trying to say. He was trying to say, doing consistent action. That's what bringing your sacrifice in the morning and the evening is. We are not a bumper sticker religion. We are not an ideological religion. We are a mitzvah, doing religion. We are the people of mitzvah, of action, of doing. And that, he said, is the most important lesson 
in the Torah. That's what Rabbi Shmuley Yankowitz taught me about that saying. Doing is the most important thing in the Torah. Because if you learn the values but you do nothing with or about them, then they're just bumper stickers, just virtue signaling, which might make us feel good. But they don't change our families, and they don't change our communities or our nation or our world. That is what I believe the renovation of the sanctuary signifies. We didn't just talk, we did. We renewed the old, sanctified the new. We opened the doors of the synagogue wide to all who sought to come in, no matter their bank backgrounds, no matter their family structures, no matter their ethnic or racial origins. We made sure no one, no one was disconnected from this shul and this community during COVID, and we continue to do that to this very day to this sacred moment. We fight for Israel, we fight for Jewish education, for Jewish community, and our community at large. That is why this newly renovated sanctuary has the same holiness of the sanctuary that was on 163rd Street and the one that was first built here in 1995. One more lesson. Have you ever noticed, take a look at the candelabras, the manoas on the wall. What's the problem? There's only six. What was the candelabra in the temple, the ancient temple? It was seven. Candelabra seven, seven days of creation. So here, there are only six. Now, I was here the day this sanctuary was dedicated in 1995. I wasn't a rabbi here yet, but Rabbi Max asked me to come. I grew up here, so it was my pleasure. I felt the excitement personally, and then afterwards I approached Rabbi Max and I asked him about the missing branch. His first response was his typical sharp mind and humor. He said, well, to tell you the truth, Ed, we ran out on the budget. We can only afford six branches. Isn't that, isn't that Rabbi Max? Absolutely. But then he got serious. He says, you know, I wanted everyone to know this is not the ancient temple. This is not perfection. This is not complete. We need to earn that seventh branch. We need to work for it. And the other thing I'd like to add to that is a lesson we learn at the wedding. It's like the glass we break at the end of the wedding to remind us under the chuppah, perfecto. Everything is perfect. The Garden of Eden, it's Adam and Eve. But once we leave the chuppah, it's the real world. And the real world has a lot of brokenness, like that glass. It's not the Garden of Eden. We need to be prepared for that brokenness. We need to commit ourselves to put the pieces of the broken glass, which is God's world, back together, one mitzvah at a time, one act of kindness at a time. That's why the seventh branch is missing. You are the seventh branch. You are the seventh branch. And you are the seventh branch. We, we are the seventh branch. The candelabra, the menorah, can only be full. It can only burn at its full brightness if we fulfill the mission that that menorah represents. Seven days of creation, our partnership with our creator, and our partnership with each other every part of this Am Yisrael, of this wide, different, incredible Jewish nation, our partnership with our community and our partnership with Israel. May the menorah of this holy community continue to burn brightly as it has in the past and as it will in the future, for the old will be renewed and the new will be made holy. And may we be worthy to be considered a seventh branch of the menorah, helping to fulfill our mission as a synagogue and as a Jewish community. And may this be God's will. Kein yehi rasson, shana tova, umatika, a happy, healthy new year to all.
absolutely superb, I even cried, in Spanish. Ay, 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 ay. So, Hazen, what do you want now? I don't know. That. <laughs> <laughs> Standing ovation. <laughs> You know, Marshall Meyer once taught me, only surround yourself by talent, and that's one I took very seriously. You see how much talent we have on the left side. Thank you to both cantors for an amazing show. <laughs> so page 149, Uvechen. Uvechen. Ten pack de jalpolma se 